Hi, uh, Alan, this question is for you. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the living building challenge standard, uh, see if you've been involved in that at all, and I understand there's only 23 buildings in the United States that have met it at this point, and just what your thoughts are. Yeah, um, there is one in Texas, it's in Decatur. Um, I love the Living Building Challenge, so it's sort of, it's net zero water, net zero energy, red list free, so from a chemical perspective, you can't put anything in your building that, that has any um, chemicals of concern that have been identified on a red list. It's, um, it is very aspirational. I have seen the projects that are the most successful of the Living Building Challenge be of a much smaller scale than the, t the work that we typically do. Um, I do think that it is, it is an appropriate um, certification for some building types, but I don't think large commercial, I don't think that it's scalable to large commercial projects um, across of our portfolio. So I, I mean, I, um, I see that LEED is sort of the, the mainline certification and, and as building codes are getting more stringent, LEED is struggling um, in and of itself to stay ahead. I, I, I learned a lesson the hard way that you can't, um, you can't do living building challenge all by yourself. If your client doesn't value it, then it's not gonna happen. <coughs> Hi there, this is some questions for Holly. You mentioned the difference between measuring outputs and outcomes, mm -hmm. and I know we wrestle with that. Um, but a lot of times it's a matter of capacity for a nonprofit to be able to measure outcomes is a big task. I just wonder if your outputs, like trees planted or pollinator plants planted or litter pollution removed, um, are based in science and in the find, you know, best practices and the findings that we know are beneficial to wildlife. If, you know, I guess the question is, they're still worth doing, even if you don't have the capacity to, to measure the outcomes. Yeah, first of all, can you stand up? <laughs> oh, okay, right there. I'm like, <laughs> I just hear a voice, but I didn't see you. Sorry. Um, no, that's a great question. Uh, so I came into the organization about four years ago, and we did a very small scale study of trying to measure outcomes, species outcomes, and we did it in very uh, small watersheds, uh, you know, looking at Eastern Brook Trout, for example, up in the eastern part of the United States and removing barriers and invasives and you see them come back. We tried to take that model and overlay it on this uh, landscape approach. And it's been difficult because it's a lot more variables, it's a lot more species, it's a lot more challenges and conservation need, and sometimes your interventions don't always get uh, the outcomes you want. So my answer would be, um, we should still try to figure out how our interventions are having an outcome, a positive effect, because everybody is, is, is doing the metrics and hoping that good things will come of that, right? And that's, how we, and that's how we've been operating, is we're gonna do good things and good things will happen. We're gonna have to start moving towards sh showing the proof in the pudding, basically, is really being able to find those indicators that show, that show that the interventions that we're doing in conservation is starting to have an effect at a population or a community level. It's hard, and we're, we're, we just did a whole, uh, one on the monarch butterfly where we've been doing a tremendous amount, actually working with Texas by Nature on monarch butterfly habitat. And there's a recent study that came out that now measures how much milkweed is needed to uh, sustain uh, two breeding pairs of monarchs. And so now we've calculated how much we need across their entire migration pathway to increase the population of monarch butterfly to a level that's sustainable, even if they get impacted in Mexico. So, that, the, so the advances are happening, the research is coming, and we just gotta then start to implement it into our uh, efforts. So yes, we still gotta do metrics. People like metrics. They wanna know how many communities they're engaged in, how many people they're working with, but the added benefit is the outcome. Can I comment on that too? Um, you know, the number of likes you get may not be a good measure, um, but it is an outcome. Aww. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is, it, 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 just like I said when I was speaking that, that you're, the, the pathway of communication depends on the person you're communicating with and what's gonna be effective. How you measure depends on who you're measuring for. If you're measuring for your granting organization, they want, may wanna know how, to, how many students you touched or how many, um, Monarch butterflies you saved. I mean, they may have a very specific measure, but if you're 
talking to donors, their outcomes are probably stories. What did that one student who you changed their life, that's a story for your donor, right? And so when you're thinking about what am I measuring, you're measuring for the person that you're trying to influence. And before you go into that conversation, make sure you understand what will influence them. Ellen, um, is HKS doing anything looking at mass timber builds and bringing that into the south, looking at cross-laminated timber and our new introduction of that into Texas markets? Yeah, so that goes back to that embodied carbon question. And would, if you're looking at the embodied carbon um, of structural materials, um, then wood comes out on top almost every time, regardless of where the, the forest is. Um, <coughs> The economic piece of it becomes a little bit more challenging when you're in places that aren't in close proximity. I think most of the, the CLT is coming from the Pacific Northwest or <laughs> Georgia. Um, so the, the economics of it look a little bit different when we're, we're talking about bringing it to Texas. But we do have a number of projects that are looking into it. It's, um, in some ways, it's been interesting because it's been a, a relatively easy sell in some um, Market sectors, hospitality being one because it's pretty. And so even if the client doesn't care about the embodied carbon, they like it because it's pretty and it could potentially be a market differentiator for them. So yes, we're seeing a lot of interest. It's right there. Uh, Ellen, you mentioned that uh, certain types of buildings, such as uh, living buildings, might not be scalable. I wonder if there's a word we need to add to that, which is they're not scalable yet. Yeah. Exactly. I think that word yeah. yet is a word we all need to keep in mind with everything we've addressed today. I would absolutely agree with that. And there are, um, there are things like the zero code that are coming out that are going to start to make that a lot easier. And I think that we're starting to look at um, energy consumption on a more municipal level, which starts to make that easier. Um, water is a hard thing because of water rights. Um, so net zero water has been hard, but I, yeah, I agree. I think that um, the trends are moving in the right direction and the sense of urgency that's within the architecture community has ramped up to a level that, I mean, I've been um, kind of in the sustainability world for over, over a decade, and it's really within the last 18 months that I've really seen the AIA double down. I've seen, um, you know, sort of the industry at large start to take the responsibility that we have much more seriously than do you want lead, yes or no. So I'd like to close, if we don't have any more, with, with one last question for each of you. You each gave incredible nuggets uh, for us to take away. But if you could leave the attendees today with the one thing to concentrate on to make an impactful partnership, because all of you have such strong partnerships around the world, what would that be? So the one thing that we, as both business leaders and conservation leaders, should address with our partnerships. Well, I can start. I mean, I think I kind of alluded to it, that if you find the overlap between your mission and the, the, the donor, the corporation, the, the, the business partner that you want to collaborate with. When I said, you know, this, this business roundtable, Find out who signed it and see, and go and ask, you know, how can we help you achieve your goal, Mr. CEO? Because they, these companies have a goal of conservation community engagement, and they need partners just like you need partners. Find your natural fit based on your mission, their mission, your history, their history, and go sit down and have a conversation. So you kind of stole my answer, but Sorry. I'll try and read. <laughs> I'll try and rephrase it. Um, we, um, I attended a presentation in the spring that was all about um, biomimicry, which is kind of a fancy word for um, mimicking systems in nature. Um, so I think an example that people know about, or may perhaps have heard about, is um, looking at the, um, 
the design of, of shark skin when you're looking at wetsuits and try, so trying to mimic something that nature has done beautifully to enable a shark to move smoothly through the water and uh, mimicking that for something like a wetsuit, so, so by a mimicry. But um, the, the thing that I came away with was an, under, was an understanding that in nature, um, relationships have to be symbiotic or they won't last. Um, and so in order for a relationship um, to last or, or an initiative like Citizen HKS to last, to your point, there has to be a benefit back to the company. I think even the most well-intentioned company is not going to move beyond a, a project or two here or there unless they see the benefit. So it, it's been really important for us to capture those stories, to capture um, uh, you know, all of the, the people that come into HKS and tell the hiring manager that they're here because they want to work on citizen HKS projects. It's, it's really important that we have that, that evidence, even if it's anecdotal, because otherwise, um, if I'm not there to, to move that initiative forward, then it's, it's likely to fail. But if there's clear and, and demonstrable value there, then that's going to outlast that, that's going to outlast me and it's going to expand through the industry. Yeah, and I think just to add, just to, to actually pile on to very similar is to um, understand what pe why people are at the table. Um, everybody has different drivers uh, and um, knowing what's in it for them. And once you know that, you can try to find that common ground. And then in, in as long as you know what's in it for them, continue to provide the return on the investment. And um, I also think just to the earlier question about metrics, is it's also the way we communicate uh, and how we, we uh, propose our projects to folks. If they want to know the return on investment or what's in it for them, you have to include that monitoring and metrics and measures as part of the proposal. A lot of times we think about proposing a project and then we have this add-on of the measures and metrics and try to get resources for it. We have to incorporate that into our philosophy and that's part of the package of what's in it for them. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much.